Um, uh, good morning or evening uh, to you all, uh, wherever you're joining us uh, for today's session. Um, there are some slides here that are playing on loop, hopefully. Um, I don't know if that's working. Um, I don't think so, uh, but you can. If you want, I can serve the slides for you, and I can um, and I can move them along as you uh, as you cover this. Uh, sure. Um, I will exit out of this in that case. Thank you, Cora. Um, so welcome to the first uh, set of uh, presentations at the Force Eleven conference today. Uh, we have um, two presenters today. And we will take um, Q and A uh, at the end of uh, both the uh, presentations. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to the uh, sponsors uh, for making this event uh, take place. Uh, so uh, Judith will be our first uh, presenter, and I will briefly introduce her now. Uh, so Dr. Judith uh, Fatala is a research and outreach associate at Lancaster University and a research fellow at uh, Coventry. Uh, she has worked with COPIM, which is community-led open publication infrastructures for monographs on the creation and launch of the Open Book Collective and on communal forms of governance. Her research interests include new media, media co convergence, digital literacies, and fan and subculture cultures in addition to open access publishing. Uh, Judith, the floor is yours and uh, you may share your slides. So Cora, if you can stop sharing, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna share my slides now if I can. Uh, share screen. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Okay, so I need to go to present. I'm, I'm not sure how to uh, put it on the slideshow format. If you click on the little, um, on the little icon at the very bottom, I think, or or that is the easiest way. And just next to where you can um, zoom in or zoom out, there is a little icon at the bottom right. Um, yeah, just next yeah. to the minus sign, not this one, the other, the opposite end, this one. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. So um, I'm going to introduce you to the work of the Open Book Collective today. And the link, if you like, or really the fundamental alignment with the whole theme of this conference is about supporting bibliodiversity in open access book publishing, by which we mean bibliodiversity, both of the kind of books that can be published to open access, the language they're published in, and the local relevance to communities. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges that um, bibliodiversity has faced when it comes to OA publishing and some of the ways that the Open Book Collective has is working to overcome those. So as some of you probably know, we've seen some major moves towards an international landscape for open access, including open access books, which have traditionally lagged behind journal articles, such as the UK RI's open access policy in 2021, that is a landmark that means that from January 2023, all research pub that has been funded by one of the major UK funding bodies will have to be um, open access, including books and book chapters. So that's a new development. The White House mandate of 2022, meaning that all uh, research funded by the White House is going to have all publicly funded research in America is going to be open access. And the same for Coalition and Plan S um, here in Europe. But it's not all, I mean, those are very positive, but there are also problems and challenges with that. And what we're seeing is that the landscape of OA publishing, open access publishing, is constantly being encroached upon by what Nick Schrinek has called 
platform capitalism, whereby for-profit companies who are operating in, in both similar areas and different areas expand and monopolize to extract um, and capitalize upon the centralization of data and database platforms. Um, and that is happening as we see, for example, in the takeover and acquisition of open access infrastructures like Knowledge and Latched by Wiley, the takeover of the press by Elsevier and of F1000 by Dick Taylor and Francis. So obviously these are major, massive global corporations that are acquiring much smaller and, and more variable um, OA initiatives and absorbing them into these monopolies that are then able to capitalize upon user data and related metrics. And you know, at Copeland, we find that very problematic. We have a lot of issues with that. And you can read our full statement on the corporate acquisition of OA infrastructure um, at the link there on the slide. But what we think some of the major problems with that as particularly related to the, the, the theme of the local thinking and acting both locally and globally is that it entrenches the dominance of wealthy academics and institutions from the global north who are gonna have the funding and the ability to pay the book processing charges that these corporations are charging. Well, those academics and institutions that are already dominant in the publishing hierarchy, it entrenches a bias to English in academic publishing, which of course is already huge, and it puts pressure on the global south to neglect local issues for publication um, on interests to a US and European audience. And uh, Akune has written a very good uh, piece on that in 2019, which you can see linked in the references to this piece. And this is despite the fact that if we look at um, OAPEN's data on which OA books are downloaded, we see what Ronald Schneider calls a global preference for regional subjects. So people all over the world are looking for OA books on subjects that are important to their local region. So what the Open Book Collective is trying to do is create an environment where smaller and much more diverse OA publishers can not only sustain themselves, but thrive. And we have formed a not-for-profit collective in order to do that, to enable libraries and institutions to discover and support a more diverse international range of small to medium open access book publishers. The Open Book Collective is in the process of registering as a charity in the UK. That means that it cannot be acquired by a, corp a for-profit corporation that is in the charter. Um, and you can see here some of our current members. So we have um, some of our library members that have joined us as supporters, including the University of Cambridge Libraries, University of Manchester Libraries, um, we have some others that are um, joining us surely, Kay Levin there from, from Europe, and some of the logos of the small to medium open book publishers that we, uh, our membership, including African Minds, um, Matron Press, Media Studies Press, and so on. So I still have 10 minutes, and in that 10 minutes, I'd like to show you our platform website. So I'm going to minimize these slides. I had hoped to put, I have got a link in here, but I think it's easier if I just minimize this and go in the browser. Sorry, not that. <laughs> um, just a second. Yeah, I probably should have just followed the link. <laughs> Open book. Right. Okay, here we go. So here's our platform website. And Good day. 
yeah you may need to you may need to uh re share your screen again because i think we're still using seeing the powerpoint you might have just chosen that one window to be shared um as your screen okay just a second yeah you can just stop sharing and share again oh now we can Is see that it. okay that's good well actually that's preferable because it means you didn't see a bunch of stuff that I didn't mean to show you. <laughs> okay. So this is our website. And you can see here we've laid out some of the aims that we stand for such as sustainable funding delivering more reliable revenue streams to small and medium publishers to help them move away from those book processing charges that as I mentioned um entrench some of the inequities and monopolies already extant in academic publishing. Um, so if I am, for example, a library, I might want to discover and support initiatives that are relevant to my interests. So I'll click here on build your subscription, just for an example. And here we see um, some of the pre-made packages that a library may choose to support, or I may choose to look at individual initiatives. And here we see African Minds, DOAB and Open, which I'm sure some of you are already familiar with. So we support infrastructure providers as well, Mattering Press. And then a library may build a bespoke quotation um, using these, seeking, for example, publishers and infrastructure providers that are relevant to their interests and the needs of their institution. They may build a quotation, get in touch with us. We handle the administration and billing involved. And then that support goes to the infrastructure providers and publishers selective, meaning that they are able to continue their OA activities. One of the one of the membership criteria is that it has to be any revenue from the OA Book Collective has to be used for the creation of open access and the sustaining of open access material um, and allowing them to move away from book processing charges. Also available to everyone is the entire catalog with rich metadata um, available for all of our publishers books. You can also, if you're interested, go to our documentation site, which gives you more detailed information on matters such as our governance and organizational models. As a charity, the OBC is governed by its members and all members have the opportunity to be involved in every level of governance, terms and conditions and our short leaflet and so on. That's, we call this our information hub. So I will leave it there because I don't want to overload you with information. And if anybody has any question about the OBC, our work and our activities, or indeed about wanting to learn more about joining us, I'll answer that at the end. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Judith, uh, for your presentation. Um, our next presenter is uh, Scott Edmonds. Uh, he is the editor-in-chief of Giga Science Press. Uh, with over 15 years experience in open access and open data publishing, he is co-founder of Civic Site, formerly Open Data Hong Kong, and Citizen Science Asia, and is on the board of directors of the Triad Digital Repository. Uh, based in Hong Kong, he's a PhD, uh, he has a PhD in cancer molecular biology and additional experience teaching data curation and management at Hong Kong University. Uh, Scott, the floor is yours and you may share your slides. Right. Great. Okay, you can hear me okay? And yes, you can see these slides. Let me know. Yes. If it works. Great. Uh, so yes, good evening, everyone from Hong Kong. So um, I am going to talk about uh, data and uh, nerdy publishing platforms and tech, but try to make it um, relevant to the themes of this conference and, and show that it can have consequences far and wide, right down to the level of public health and the most 
remote parts of the uh, Amazon rainforest, for example. Um, uh, so this, um, uh, yeah, this this really relates to um, to data, to, to large scale data, and um, it's a very overused cliche um, in in this in this topic that you know people keep talking about data is the new oil and and making analogies to you know how oil can kind of power um how data can kind of uh, power research and and um the economy but uh, it, it's it's quite a, a, a nasty um analogy and, and and concept because oil is is so polluting um has made you know many uh, horrible um consequences just dis destroying the planet geopolitical instability and the like and maybe more you know it has more constructive uh, connotations um in in terms of uh, lubrication and and reducing the, the ability of of oil to kind of reduce friction and things and this sort of more constructive analogy um is one that we've been uh, following in in giga science um, if you don't uh, know what, uh, what what we do, we're a, we're a journal that has been um, publishing data um, since uh, 2012, and and really using this, really thinking of things in this kind of reducing friction um, concept. In that, you know, we 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 want to make it we want to make it easier to to put for um, people to, to to share their data, um, providing a credit with these data note articles. Um, you know, providing contextual information on how you do this, and but making the process as easy as possible by also having our own um, data curation, um, uh, data curators, data team on hand to kind of work with the authors to to make this a kind of all inclusive process. Um, and uh, if necessary, um, if we even have our own data repository, GigaDB, to make sure that nothing kind of falls through the gaps. Um, and so, yes, as I say, we've been working in this open data, open science space for a decade, and it's great um, to see this really become mainstream over this time. Um, 18 months ago, uh, nearly 200 uh, member states um, through UNESCO signed this uh, open, this recommendation on open science, making a commitment to fulfill the human rights of access to science and stating that they will take whatever um, measures to, to put this in legislation to, um, you know, for, for, for funders and, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, mandates to start to, to work towards uh, moving this into, into policies and practices. Um, so uh, one great thing that this open science recommendation did, it's, it's a great report if, if you've not read it, but it really defines and, and pulls, teases apart what open science is. Um, and they define four key pillars in, in open science, um, open science knowledge, open science infrastructures, open engagement of societal actors, and open dialogue with other knowledge systems. And um, last year, our 10th birthday, uh, with this published, we thought it would be a great exercise to map our efforts over the last decade um, to these four key pillars. And we saw that we all of our, the vast majority of our efforts were in the area of open science knowledge and open science infrastructures, things like licensing, transparency, uh, many um, technical integrations that, you know, uh, we've tried to make our papers more reproducible. And where we definitely uh, have, have, have lacked um, and, and need to work on for our next decade are the areas of open engagement of societal actors, um, you know, working with uh, you know citizen science and 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 um, um, things like crowdsourcing and 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 the like. And the most tricky of all, open dialogue with other knowledge systems. These are the, the trickiest barriers holding things back. Um, costs being a, a a really big barrier and uh also uh how how you communicate this um language um you know multi you know multilingual uh issues and 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 even how to get around kind of jargon and things like this and so this is what we you know we've we've been thinking about these issues for for a while and and the way that we decided to try to address this is um 
with a lot of this is technical. Um, we realized that the publishing tech was was holding um, us back for a, a lot of these barriers. And so working with uh, River Valley Technologies, an amazing development team in India, um, this completely new platform um, did has done everything in XML first. It's really leveraged XML technology. And, and this sounds a bit, bit tenuous, a bit, a bit techy, but this actually has the potential of having much more inclusive features addressing these issues of cost, uh, interactivity, and language. Having this uh, almost completely automated production process, humans just need to step in and, and tweak some of the pagination and, and um, where some of the, you know, the, the, where the figures go in the page has taken something that can take mon months for, for many of the traditional publishers. We've got it down to as little as four hours, um, meaning this really reduces the cost and, and you know, time to, to get this research out. But it also allows parallel proofing of different languages. It allows you to view the papers um, in different ways and, and also put auto, you know, interactive content much more easily. This has enabled us to um, make our article processing charges a fifth to a tenth of what we were charging with working with traditional publishers as well. So th th this is really big barriers um, that it has the potential to break. And so giving some examples of how we, you know, how, how this can kind of roll out into the field. This journal Gigabytes launched um, about two years ago and um, to, to uh, you know, give examples of, of how, you know, yeah, how publishing data uh, works. Um, and, and a real big issue that, that needs addressing um, is, a, is the biodiversity crisis, right? So this is, this is actually, uh, there's, a, there's a big data issue here. It was mentioned earlier, you know, what measured, what gets measured gets done. And um, to address the biodiversity crisis, we, we need data. So this was a great paper published a few years ago in, in Nature Communications, where they look at where all of the biodiversity is. They, they look at species richness. And uh, so if you look at this top, the, the, the globe on the top here, um, red is rich. Red is where all of the species are. And you can see that where the, you know, the vast majority of, of life on this, you know, the diversity of life on the planet is, is this region in the middle of the globe, that the, the, the tropical, um, tropical uh, regions in, in, in the center are where everything lives. But actually, where if you look at the second globe, where the data is, how much the completeness of biodiversity records, um, blue and gray is where we, we lack data, right? So where all of the biodiversity is, we actually lack the least uh, information, you know, proportionally the least information. And so we need to really uh, fill these gaps. Um, and um, the, the, the organization that's kind of stepped in to, to do this um, set up uh, to GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, set up by OECD in 1999 to be the kind of global body, the, the database of databases uh, to, that collects all of this information. There are billions of data points and counting here. And um, they've done a great job in, in collecting, you know, th there's a vast amount of information, but looking at this uh, kind of data map that they, that they produce, you can see gaps, right? The dark green is where, again, um, there is less data. And how have they collected their data over time? Well, um, they, they call these data mobilization efforts. And, and these are from the very beginning of the organization and this infrastructure that they, they have really targeted this. Um, to start with, they, they really targeted the museums, the natural history museums, uh, government collections, academic collections, um, herbaria, um, uh, all, all of these kinds of areas that, that you know, the, the, the initial efforts were to really target and, and ingest all of the, all of these historical collections, which, which is great and, you know, has, has made up uh, so much of this data. Um, but, you know, this is really looking backward, right? This is historical data and how do you get the data going forward, you know, the, the latest data. So one big, and actually now the biggest source of this has been citizen science data. Um, and, you know, citizens can go everywhere. They've got, you know, smartphones and, and, and can, can, you know, go to where these gaps are. And so they've done a huge, um, uh, they're now creating vast amounts of data with a number of citizen science platforms. 
um, uh, the, the biggest ones being iNaturalist and eBird. And once data gets uh, validated um, by various means, it, it becomes research grade. And now the biggest source of uh, most of the data in GBIF is actually these research grade observations that have been collected by, by citizens, by you know, these society, societal actors uh, contributing. Um, but again, there are biases here. People love birds, right? This is very heavy on birds and maybe not so heavy in other areas. And so the, uh, another targeted um, approach um, that has come about in, in, the, in recent years are um, through data publications, through data journals such as ourselves. And this can then really hone in on like the, 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 the really key gaps. Um, geographic, and so uh, Pensoft has, has really led the way in this with their biodiversity data journal, um, kind of uh, seeing that like the biggest geographic gap is, is, is Eurasia, uh, Russia, Northern Eurasia, the former Soviet republics. And so they've done some targeted data calls and, and sponsored by, um, you know, getting external funding to remove this final barrier, remove the article processing charge to, to you know, reduce friction. Um, and so they've done geographic calls and also um, in terms of biota, right, in terms of biomes. Um, their most recent call is on soil biodiversity looking at organisms that, that live in the soil. And uh, this call is actually open now. Um, if people have this kind of data, then please go to, uh, please go to um, the BDJ. And uh, Page Press um, has, has focused on uh, freshwater biodiversity, spe species that, that live, in, if, live in water. So, you know, looking at various biomes that, that have these sort of data gaps as well, and really targeting these, the, these you know, crucial gaps. And so this is where we have set in, uh, stepped in with our Gigabyte Journal, and um, we have done a recent call on, on one particular type of biodiversity data that actually has great implica huge implications for public health, and these are vectors of human disease. Now, um, this call uh, has been supported by uh, TDR, the Special Programme for Research and Training in uh, Tropical Diseases from uh, the UN and the World Bank and has been sponsored by the World Health Organization. So they have covered the costs on this to, to reduce friction to you know, as low as possible. On top of the kind of cost barrier, they've also um, sponsored a, a data help desk. So there's, a, there's a, um, people on hand who will help um, people to, to, to share their data, right? To reduce that barrier even more. And um, they just need to email health at gbif.org and the, this help desk will 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 you know reduce reduce that barrier even further so know your enemy what are what are these um what are these like nasty things um so the vectors of human vector borne diseases are things like mosquitoes sand flies nasty ticks all these like itchy nasty things that that spread human disease but uh, actually these you know these tiny in insects and, and and other parasites actually account for a quarter of all infectious diseases on the globe I think, you know, malaria, uh, dengue, um, you know, yellow fever, all, all of these uh, nasty, nasty diseases. And if you look uh, again on the map where the, you know, the vast majority of the effects of these things are, again, it's this region in the middle of the world, the, the, this, you know, it's biodiverse, it lacks data, and this is where people are predominant, you know, predominantly affected by these uh, nasty, nasty um, infectious diseases. And um, so to, uh, to give a, to, to, to now look at uh, one, one example of these and one that we uh, targeted in this series, uh, Leishmaniasis is a, uh, a nasty and neglected tropical disease spread by these tiny, tiny little sand flies, but it ha the disease has uh, three different forms, cutaneous, mucocutaneous, and visceral, the visceral form uh, in particular, um, uh, fatal if untreated, and a very, very nasty disease. Um, uh, and uh, the, again, the vast majority of cases of this are in the um, are in uh, Latin America, South America, North Africa, and the Middle East. And um, Brazil uh, and, and uh, South America is particularly badly affected. Brazil having the highest cases of visceral and second highest cases in cutaneous form. And um, 
the wear in Brazil is affected 50%, uh, 42% of it in the, in the north, in the, in the Amazon region in particular. And control and, uh, it, of this disease is, is based on disease surveillance and monitoring. But this is really, really tricky in these remote areas of the country, right? How do you do a, a surveillance program in the middle of the rainforest? And, um, and one, uh, it was noted um, back in 2010, 2012, that a few indigenous communities were having outbreaks. The Wahapi, a, a small uh, group in the, in the remote um, northern reaches of the rain, of Amazon rainforest with only 1,200 individuals, and the Surawaha, um, a, a, a community with only 170 individuals, um, seemed to be getting uh, outbreaks in this, but very little was, was known uh, about how and why and, and you know, how, how, how they required treatment and the like. And so public health workers went out into the field and did proactive field work, working with these communities, collect, uh, collecting sand flies uh, and this occurrence data and um, found some pretty interesting things, um, but this data was sort of, uh, wasn't shared for a decade. And so this call actually uh, incentivized and helped them to share this data publicly. And uh, nearly 5,000 records were collected from these communities. And, and there were really interesting things found that, in, for example, the reason that there was this increase in 2010, 2012 was this was because this was when these communities first got access to flashlights. Um, it actually then changed their hunting process practices, allowed them to hunt at night for the first time, but this put them in more contact with these tiny little sand flies that spread this disease. Um, in the process of collecting this data, um, the, the, the paper noted that these data may have been, be of particular importance to balance scientific knowledge with indigenous knowledge to improve health surveillance activities and adapt these to different eco-social contexts with the participation of indigenous people who better know their territories. So it was a really great example of um, they didn't, you know, they didn't just come in and take the data and, and leave. They actually worked with these communities. Um, and this this particular case study, this data can be of use to to others, um, other you know other people working in the field, um, um, trying to do the same. Um, so it was great to credit this. It was great to help them share this. Now having uh, this XML first technology has some uh, very handy other um, uh, 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 side effects. So as I mentioned, we uh, can do parallel proofing of language. And uh, this particular paper you know, involved health workers who go into the re remote Amazon. And um, they originally wrote these papers in, in Portuguese. And, and actually, most of these public health workers, that they really need it in, 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 in Portuguese, that they, they, their, their, their English language skills are, are um, uh, a, a, a problematic for many of them. And so actually, um, you can click a button on this paper and uh, it will toggle into the, the Portuguese version. Um, and so these you know, public health workers can, can really understand it. We also linked the papers to uh, CLO preprint versions, uh, making it discoverable there. And then the data is actually in situ in the paper. You can click on a button and um, you know, the less data savvy get access to the data as well, um, right inside the paper. This is what um, this kind of technical approach does, really increasing the, the accessibility um, and under, you know, understandability of this work. Um, one thing uh, people may not know is that having the uh, alt, the different languages in the XML means that PMC, uh, the the um, you know uh, medical um, literature by medical literature database that that most researchers uh, use in the, in this field, it actually uh, mirrors um, and includes all of the different languages. So even the PMC version, uh, you can toggle between the English and Portuguese. Um, not many people um, know know of this, and um, this approach as well. You know, reducing these barriers has really helped um, societal, you know, address this societal actor um, issue uh, and, and pillar as well. So we did a several years ago. We did a citizen science project, um, working with some schools in Hong Kong, giving them, um, teaching them this this app to uh, go and take pictures of uh, dengue uh, carrying mosquitoes across Hong Kong, collecting this data. Little knowing that uh, several years later, this data set would become part of a really big citizen science database that mosquito alert um, 
then digitized and, and added to, to GBIF and, and submitted to our series, collecting uh, over 30,000 observations, all of the images that can be used for creating machine learning tools to kind of spot nasty mosquitoes. And the process of writing this paper, the, the authors found extremely useful because it really made them think about how to credit these different uh, participants in the study, the, the core team, um, the expert validators who are professional um, uh, entomologists, and also the data gatherers, the, the uh, mosquito alert community of, of citizens. And so they credited all of them in this paper. And the end result, the end product is um, we shared uh, half a million, over half a million occurrence records from these nasty mosquitoes and sand flies and ticks and, and kissing bugs um, from more than 50 countries and all of these very, very diverse data types. Um, the lessons learned here, we've written up in a, uh, an umbrella paper that you can read in Gig Science if you're interested. Um, and, uh, you know, this first call of papers had uh, about 11 uh, submissions. Um, WHO was so happy that they're now sponsoring a second uh, call, um, which is still open. Um, but I assume there are not many uh, uh, medical entomologists watching this talk. We're not going to get many calls from from um, you know uh, uh, talk, talking to to you now. But what I want to really get across is, is the the potential for this approach um, uh, for for other areas of data, right? The the to fill all of these data gaps. We we all have areas that we we know we need we need data, and these targeted sponsored data mobilization um, events can really um, incentivize and, and get like you know, very large amounts of very, very useful data. You have to reduce the, you know, reduce the friction, um, um, but it's it's very cost effective, right? The, the our, our costs are, are exceedingly low. You can get, you know, huge amounts of this data for the, the you know, many, many, cover an entire series of papers for the cost that, you know, one of these sort of glamour journals would charge for their APCs. And it really, coming back to the, the, to the oil analogy, it really shows that, or oil has oils have another property. You know, you can think of essential oils. You can think of healing oils and balms. And, and data has the potential to 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 heal and and fix and and address public health issues. You know, you can use it to really work with communities as you know as as, as far and wide as you know the depths as the the Amazon rainforest to to address um, social and and um public health uh, um, and environmental issues um so we need to thank um uh, who tdr for their generous um, support of this series and, and covering all of the costs and um yeah hopefully we have some time now to answer uh, questions and I, I hope this provoke promotes some uh discussion so yeah thank you for your time thank you stop. scott that was a great uh presentation. Uh, there are a few uh, questions uh, in the chat for you. Uh, Kate asks um, or says that she's interested in the thematic help desk for data curation or deposit, and uh, she'd like to hear or read more about the impact and how stakeholders uh, came to realize it would be worth supporting and if you have any suggestions. So this is just one, this is just one case study. And um, yeah, so a GBIF, G, uh, so GBIF are the people to talk on the kind of like that behind the scenes part because they have, you know, they are the data, they're the database, they're the custodians of this data, but they really saw a need for um, for these targeted efforts. They could see that there were gaps in their own data. And so they then, you know, they brought some of their own funding to the table and they also got external funders like the WHO to, to you know, talking to them. They're like, these are small amounts of money that can have a, make a big effect. And um, so, you know, initially they were sponsoring the the just just the APCs, but with this recent call, they could see that there were de there's definitely a challenge for you know we're going into new areas and and uh, finding new people who may not have shared data in this manner, and it, it's definitely that's definitely a barrier. So they could see that um, having having more cu curatorial support um, would definitely um, would definitely help the process. So I I, I can't speak on. You know, I don't, I don't run the help desk, and and they uh, GBIF would be the people to talk to on that. But um, yeah, they they have used that those funds to uh, contract somebody to to work and 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 run this, uh, an experienced curator, and and 
again, it, it has a cost, but it has you know huge benefits, right? If it, it, this is a, a useful approach for, for for funders and anybody with small amounts of money that like, okay, yeah, we, if, we paying some paying a professional cu uh, curator to you know work on this one particular issue can have a can have a big impact. So, thank you. Uh, she also has another question. How does the data inside the paper model work when people are working with limited bandwidth? So, um, so the it's a paper, right? The 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 um, it's an open access publication, um, and uh, at a very basic level, you have a data available. You insist upon a data availability section at the end of the paper, and from there you cite the data set. In GBIF gives the data a, a DOI, and you have to cite it at the at the end of the paper. So anybody reading the paper can just kind of like click on that citation and access the data that way. Um, we we've with our funny XML, you know, format, we we have embedded the maps inside the paper as well, and you and you can you know pop it out that way. But ultimately, you just need that you just need the data citation in a bandwidth, um, in a you know in a low bandwidth environment. Um, you can you know it it still takes bandwidth to access the paper. I I think the PMC version of that is you know uh, hopefully a takes a little bit less bandwidth right their, their XML is is quite flat and we're not you're not downloading that data right the the you, you're just reading the paper and then if you want to access the data then then you can click it it, it yeah that will be a challenge in a uh, once you at least you can kind of read the source of the data read the you know get the lessons learned from the paper and then if you do need to then download that data set. You have to download that data set ultimately, but um, yeah. Okay, uh, and one more question. Um, she's also curious about the multilingual aspect. Uh, she's guessing that the second language version is generated by people and not machine translation. Do the authors do it? Are there professional translators, and do they get compensated? So that is a very that is a very good question. So. Um, Currently, this platform just makes that process easier, and we have to make decisions on how how we get these translations. So to start with, we're, we're just showcasing we can. And so if the authors have a version in multiple languages, um, you know, it, it this is human this is human translated um, content. If we wanted to go down the route of machines and then maybe put like a little disclaimer on this, we we you know it, it it's technically very feasible we've made the conscious decision to start with that we want we want humans to um we, we just want human human content for now the english version is the version of record and then the the uh, the, the alternative versions are just there as a kind of uh, added bonus um but uh yeah, we, we the, these examples. We half of the submissions in this, the half of the submissions in the first part of the call were from Latin America, and we could tell from reading that, looking at the data, the data abstracts were all in Portuguese and in Spanish, and so I, I, I we had a feeling that like they probably are writing these papers first in their native language and then translating it to English. And I asked them, "Have you got both versions?" And they said, "Yes, yes, we do." So I was saying, "Please don't throw away the the you know the Spanish Portuguese versions and." And and we and the, the the parallel proofing just means it takes an, a, a couple of hours for each additional language to prove, so it makes it super super easy. So that that's how we did this. But yeah, going forward, um, if there were you know we could if there was funding to hire um, translators, we 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 can do that. You we need to be a bit more confident about you know auto, uh, you know automated uh, translation, but it's all very possible. You just have to be willing to. Um, Take it, yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's a question for Judith. Uh, what kind of support or advice uh, do traditional book uh, traditional books publishers are most commonly after to help them transition to open access? Are they willing to collaborate on those efforts? Re by and large, I think it depends on the publisher. I mean. If you think, but obviously, we are such a missions based and values based organization that the kind of publishers that approach us and the kind of publishers that reach out to us are very willing to collaborate and um, actively are seeking to transition to OA. And the only thing 
that's preventing them usually is the fact that they don't have a sustainable and reliable revenue source, which is what obviously we're hoping to utilize this consortial funding model or this development of a consorting consortial funding model to assist with. Now, the we do have certain criteria, certain membership criteria that we um, want that we require our publisher members to abide by. Um, and one of those is a certain, I can't remember the percentages off by heart, but you can read it sort of on the on the governance pages on the document site, that they already, you know, have a certain percentage of, of OA books that they are, and that they are transitioning, at least transitioning towards more and transitioning away from book processing charges. So yeah, by and large, the publishers that have reached out to us so far have sort of been like, wow, this sounds fantastic. You know, we just need help we just need assistance and also one of the nice things about the OBC is that it is a community and that we have slightly more slightly more experienced publishers such as open book publishers which is I think been around since 2008 um, who are able to provide more kind of practical and pragmatic assistance we've recently actually received funding um, and an additional three years of funding um, to move from as the Cohen project is closing and our sort of our future project that we're going into is called Open Book Futures. And one of the major outcomes that we want to do with that, with the OBC, is creating toolkits, creating toolkits for publishers that want to make that transition. And also we are going to become a, um, a grant issuing organization ourselves. We have now got the funding to do that. So Basically, I think that if a publisher was not look aligned with our mission and was not aligned with our values, they probably wouldn't be reaching out to us in the first place. Yes, the citation for Akuni, I'll get that for you now. I think there was another question for me as well, further up. Um, oh, um, is the OBC catalog available to libraries in a way the information can be ingested into library catalogs? Sorry, in a word, yes, that, that is that is kind of one of our one of our I mean a major part of our offer to libraries, if you like, because we we've, we've built this with librarians and we've been working on this for three years, is that they tell us that. A lot of the time they're looking for, they want to support OA publisher OA infrastructures, but the metadata isn't there. The metadata isn't high quality and it's not comprehensively readable or it doesn't integrate into their catalogs easily. So, you know, a requirement that we have for our publishers is the provision of comprehensive high quality metadata, preferably through um, the open source app Tote. If anybody wants to look up Tote, I think it's on. I think it's hosted on PubHub. I have to say, I'm not a programmer, and I didn't program Tote. It's another um, Copim um, output, uh, so it's a related work package. And Tote is an app that publishers can feed their catalogs into, and it produces this high quality, maximally readable metadata one thing i learned actually is that a lot of oa books are not discoverable because they don't have a price point so the commercial systems like google books and amazon don't pick them up because they require a price point um so in a word yeah that is that is one of the sort of major aims of the obc and one of the ways that we meet the the needs of our library stakeholders Yes, <laughs> yeah, we know. And that's definitely something that we've heard a lot from, from our librarian colleagues and this sort of, we hope there's a lot, you know, there's a lot about the OBC that makes it, if in sort of, in, in the terms that librarians have to think in a, a wise investment, if you like, because of the ease of comparison, the ease of workload, as well as you know the ethical the ethical and, and mission based side that we are 
that we are built on. Okay, barring none, um, I'd like to thank both the presenters uh, for uh, their fascinating talks. Um, our next session starts at 4 p.m. UTC, um, and we hope you can join us then. Thank you. Thank you.